welcome. Uh, my name is Manon Ress, and I work for Knowledge Ecology International in Washington, D.C., and I will be the moderator of this uh, timely panel on control digital lending in a pandemic. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer, actually, for uh, accepting this, uh, this great uh, panel, uh, which is really a, a good time for us to do it since uh, we are all struggling. We have a great list of speakers and uh, they will have about 10 to 12 minutes to make their initial comments before a discussion, which I hope will be lively and should be lively since there are so many ways to uh, look at what libraries are doing right now in the time of pandemic. But first, let me introduce you briefly to the issue that, uh, we'll, that we'll focus on. So while we are all in one way or another um, dealing with a uh, global pandemic, which makes in many countries access to school and libraries, if not difficult, uh, in some cases impossible, uh, and it should be like this to ensure safety for all of us, um, there's really a problem of access to knowledge and information that is creeping in everywhere. At the same time, uh, we all know that the fundamental uh, socially beneficial function of libraries uh, in all parts of the world uh, actually is to provide broad access to information and learning material. And this fundamental function is more than ever crucial to ensure economic, and maybe one day cultural recovery. I'm an optimist, and I think that we will make it through. Um, now, under different laws, and that's what we're going to explore today, or uh, community practice or cultural practices, I think libraries lend books and other materials. Right now, we are all struggling to find a way to access books. And many of us, including me, are counting on digital format for books and learning materials. Whether you're in first grade, which is a six-year-old in the US, or a student, a graduate student, or a worker, we are all trying to find access to learning materials. So in the US, but we will talk uh, quite a bit about the EU and the international situation, we are relying on what we call controlled digital lending, CDL. I hate acronym, but that's why I'd like to say controlled digital lending, but to make it shorter, we'll say CDL. And it's not a brand new concept at all. And there are already multiple version of CDL. Uh, some CDL system are statewide in the US. Some are uh, countywide or uh, citywide. Uh, I mean, some state in the U.S. are uh, developing system of lending only to residents of that state, for example. Some are institution-wide, uh, and that's uh, many schools or many school districts or many universities say only people enroll in that school or district. And very few, but there are some, are as truly global as the pandemic, and that would be probably the Internet Archive. Uh, which is very easy to get access to in, uh, in any jurisdiction, actually. Um, but now, the, the, the practice of control digital lending is really designed to mirror exactly what traditional library practice with strict rules, such as the, uh, the, the, the use of TPM, technology prediction measures, and digital rights management. Uh, and, and they are actually pretty strict. Uh, we talked to somebody who's actually selling some of the software and they all kind of different, but they all do their, their, their job. They control the uh, access. Uh, so in, books are scanned and um, they can be borrowed and read by as many users that they are copies, physical copies, in the institution or library or school. One book, one scan, one reader. And all the DRM of the world and all the TPM of the world are in place to control that fact. Uh, I myself went on the CDL system to get some books and I'm a slow reader. And after two weeks, I had to 
try to get that book again because poof, disappeared. In addition, of course, you cannot download the book. You cannot send the book. Uh, this is really a very controlled environment for access to knowledge. So a good definition of a uh, more learned definition of controlled digital lending can be found in a white paper by uh, um, David Hansen and Cal Courtney, who are uh, uh, quite famous in the, the world of CDL. They say, basically, CDL enables a library to circulate a digitized title in place of a physical one in a controlled manner. And I think under this approach, a library may only loan the same number of digital copies that they have physical copies in their, in their um, collection. Now, um, libraries first have to buy the book or get it through a donation. In the US, because I, I, CDL is really something that's very widely known in the US, but maybe not in all part of the world, the practice of CDL relies, I think, but you'll have specialists getting into the deep dive of, of this issue, relies on two important US doctrine, the fair use and the first sale doctrine. These two doctrine, which is section 109 for the first sale and section 107 for fair use, are the pillar for CDL. Um, and in brief, uh, some of you may know that the first sale doctrine is, is not a, a new thing. It's very old in, in uh, US jurisdiction. And uh, basically, if you buy a book, you can do whatever you want with it. You own that book, you can lend it, sell it, destroy it, give it to your friends. Without it, it's obvious that the copyright holders could enforce rights in the secondary market which would impact selling, loaning, gifting, any copyrighted work. So that would not even be feasible in the physical world. Um, like the fair use, first sale doctrine, fair use is also widely used in the US and is also uh, used by industries. I mean, whether home recording device manufacturers, search engine, filmmakers, publisher, um, they rely on fair use. It's something that's clearly not new. It's, it started in the 1800s, I believe, and was more codified in 1976 in Section 107 of the Copyright Law. But it's something that is, uh, is traditional, basically, in the U.S. And I won't go through the, the four um, non-exclusive factor that courts and users should consider because this is uh, getting into the <laughs> nitty gritty that uh, probably the speakers will talk about, but I did add to the chat uh, section 107 and section 109, um, the text, if you need to look at it while people talk. But there are four factors and they are taken very seriously in the US. Unfortunately now, uh, the global pandemic is causing many stakeholders to act very quickly and to do some time take position on CDL that could have negative impact on access to knowledge and information. The IP owners organization, uh, whether in the patent world, and we see that in the access to medicine uh, uh, movement or uh, the copyright world are on the defensive. And in some cases, they're even benefiting actually from the pandemic crisis. When it comes to drug issues, sometimes we talk about profiteering, but there's profiteering in many other ways in the copyright world too. And I think that in a way licensing is, is one of the issues that we should address today about the, is, is CDL an alternative or is CDL replacing licensing? But um, the goal is to hear the speakers, and uh, I hope you, you understand that uh, there's a three-step test uh, in some countries and specific exception. Uh, in some countries, there's not even public lending at all, so <laughs> that's a totally different ballgame. And then there's the fair sale doctrine uh, in the, and fair use in the U.S. and in other, many other jurisdictions, of course. So I will start with uh, asking uh, Corinne Mike Sh Sherry, who's here. Yeah, but she's muted. She is uh, the legal director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. She, she is well known and specialized in intellectual property, open access, and free speech issues. 
uh, as a litigator, her favorite cases involve protecting online fair use rights, political expression in the public domain. She has represented a uh, um, wide variety of clients, including a dancing baby that I'm sure you all saw on your, uh, on your social uh, um, network, environmental activist and public interest organization dedicated to improve access to knowledge, including, and more importantly today, the Internet Archive. Uh, she's also very much involved in uh, policy work, and she uh, testified in Congress on a regular basis. And I'm going to give Sherry the floor. I think she's muted. I don't know if somebody... Yeah, okay, cool. So I can mute myself. Okay. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining this conversation, which I hope really will be a conversation. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep myself as brief as possible. So we actually have time for that. Um, so um, as Manon just mentioned, I do represent the Internet Archive. The Electronic Frontier Foundation represents the Internet Archive in connection with some litigation around controlled digital lending. And so um, while I can say many things, I might be just a little careful sometimes so that I can protect privilege, um, because that is, of course, my first, uh, first obligation um, to my client. Um, that said, there's, there's quite a bit that we can talk about, because there's quite a bit that's just completely on the record and clear and understood um, in uh, and, uh, no great secret. Um, let me just hit on just a few of those things. First, um, I think it's important to understand some facts about the Internet Archives program. There's a lot of different forms of digital lending, but the Internet Archives um, uh, program is, I think, the one that's sort of come to the fore just, just recently in the context of this pandemic. Um, the sort of core thing to know about the Archives program and about controlled digital lending in general is it's simply doing what libraries have always done. Right. The archive does what libraries has always done. It buys, it collects, it preserves, and it lends books. Core, core library job, right? Um, and unfortunately, though, there's a lot of misinformation about that. Um, so let me break down exactly what happens. So under CDL, the archive and other libraries simply take books they already own, and then they lend out digital scans of those books on an own to loan basis, meaning they only loan out one copy of a book they already own to one person at a time. That's the basic principle. <laughs> one person can borrow one copy at a time. And then they take their physical book out of circulation. Okay, and that's really important. We have to do that right now because many, in many, many places, and this is even before the pandemic, people can't always get to the library. They can't always get access to that physical book. So digital lending is filling a very important gap. Um, but it's also not new. So the archive has been working with um, hundreds of other libraries since 2011 um, on this controlled digital lending um, project. Um, again, the books are lawfully acquired via purchase or via a donation. The archive uses, as Manuel mentioned, um, technical protection measures, standard in the industry. And I will tell you that my organization, EFF, is no great fan of DRM. But, but at any rate, this is what is um, being used here to, uh, to make sure that the own to loan um, process is, is working right, working correctly. Um, libraries, including the archive, but all of the libraries that participate in the network have paid publishers billions of dollars for these books, right? They've already been paid, they're all purchased lawfully. Um, there's nothing piratical about the whole situation. And uh, libraries are, have already paid for these books and are investing huge resources in digitizing them because it's the 21st century and that's what you have to do. Um, CDL helps libraries take the next step and loan out those books that they digitized, books that they, again, have bought and paid for. <laughs> um, it's not very different from traditional library lending that publishers don't love either, but um, nonetheless is actually, I think we think, good for access to knowledge and good for authors and good for readers. It's good for the public. Um, and another thing though that it's doing that the archives program does is, is also doing a little bit more. It's fostering 
further research and learning by making sure that books that, for example, are out of print are still accessible, which is a great, um, great thing. Um, and a good thing for authors, by the way, because one of the things I think that many authors find frustrating is their books go out of print and suddenly they're not so accessible anymore. The, the archive helps remedy that problem. So it's a good thing for authors or for many authors. But that said, I mean, I could go on about the public benefits at some length, but at the same time, if you're an author or a publisher, if you're a copyright owner and you don't want your book in that collection, the archive will take it out um, and will do so um, expeditiously. Um, okay, so that's some facts. Let's talk about the law. Um, and I'm a US lawyer, and so I'm just gonna focus here on US law. Um, as Manon has suggested, um, we believe, and we are quite sure a court will ultimately agree that um, CDL is protected by the fair use doctrine, buttressed by a host of kind of tr very traditional library protections like first sale. Um, for those who aren't, I think most of the audience here is going to be pretty f familiar with fair use. So I'll just be quick about it because, but I know there are people who are not in the United States and I don't want to assume too much. But under US law, fair use is an evaluation based on four factors. You look at the purpose of the use, you look at the nature of the original work, you think you look at how much of the original work has been used. Did you use more than you needed to for your purpose? So those two factors go together. Um, and is there has there been harm to a market? Is there a substitution to the market? Um, and then you consider all of those factors in light of the purpose of copyright, which is to promote the public interest by spurring create new creativity. Okay, so you look at all those factors together. Now let's apply them to the archive situation. Well, first, what's the purpose of the project? It's to serve the public interest in preservation, access, and research. It's entirely non-commercial. These are all classic, classic fair use purposes. Um, so factor one goes that way. Factor two, every volume in the collection has already been published and most are out of print. And so that's relevant to thinking about the nature of the work you think about, is it published or not? Um, the amount used, well, entire volumes are lent out, but that's what you have to do if you're engaging in lending. So it, it, you, it serves the purpose here. So no more is taken than you need for the purpose um, that you're after. I mean, that's what it means to check out a book from the library. That's what you do. Um, in terms of harm to the market, the bought books have already been bought and paid for by the libraries that own them. And then when you think about sort of the general public interest, which courts more and more attend to in fair use analysis, there's no question but that the public is, is deriving a huge benefit from this program. And on the flip side, rights holders gain nothing if the public is deprived of access to this resource. Last, uh, let's talk about context. Okay, um, I, I think it almost goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> right now, right now, it, this kind of activity is just essential. So many people around the world cannot access libraries, um, even in their own hometown. Um, we have a dramatic increase in distance learning, uh, and I think that's going to continue for a while, unfortunately, and we do not have a dramatic increase in education budgets. At least I haven't seen one. I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. Okay, so, um, so we have a problem. We have a problem. We have a lot of people who need books. They need books to learn. They need books to read. They need books to pass the time, and they need books to do research. How are they going to get them? One of the ways that they're going to have to get them is via digital lending. That's, and that is exactly what CDL makes possible. Um, so last thing I want to say is that, um, unfortunately, there's some rhetoric um, um, on the socials and in lots of other places that's trying to portray the archive and trying to portray CDL as some sort of piracy. Um, and we have that kind of familiar rhetoric, unfortunately, in copyright circles. The archive, the Internet Archive, is not a pirate. The libraries that are working with it, they're not pirates. They're not thieves. They're people who are trying to serve their patrons. They're people who are trying to do in the 21st century what they have always done, 
which is to preserve and lend books. Um, they're doing what they've done for centuries in the brick and mortar world. <coughs> um, and copyright law does not forbid it. In fact, it's good for authors, it's good for readers, it's even good for publishers. The copyright law does not stand in the way. And that's a really good thing. That's a good thing because we don't want a situation where publishers become the final arbiters of what we get to read and share and how we do it in the digital age. And I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions, um, but I'm love it. looking forward to hearing from the other speakers as well. Well, thank you, uh, Corinne. It's very interesting, and uh, I would add to your. Uh, it, it's it's not about power. It's I would I would add that uh, libraries are the biggest buyers of books. They are the biggest clients of the publishing industry. So, uh, to to transform to 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 talk about power seems totally bizarre. It's like accusing your best client of doing something wrong. Well, in fact, the best client is buying so many books right now, even, even now, even though the, 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 the budgets are going smaller for libraries, they're buying more books than ever. But um, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the situation in Europe. And I have Augustin Reyna, who works as a senior legal officer and digital team leader at BIOC, which is the European Consumer Organization. And within BIOC, Augustin follows the EU development around consumer rights in the digital environment. He led the digital team coordinating uh, the, the policy in the area of copyright, data protection, telecommunication, and competition. Uh, he was uh, since he's been uh, since 2017 the uh, EU co-chair of the IP group at the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which is a uh, a uh, federation of 75 consumer groups, both in the uh, in US and EU. And uh, lucky for you, he also knows quite a bit about Latin America because he's a native uh, of Argentina too. So he's the perfect person for us to explain uh, what's going on in Europe and beyond. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manon, for the, for the invitations and for, to the organizers for putting together such an interesting uh, event. Um, coincidentally or not, we have been actually discussing this issue um, from a transatlantic perspective uh, last week. And actually, as a result of that, I think uh, many of you have been also part of that discussion. And, and, and I think that um, we can bring a little bit forward what we have already uh, discussed and, and see how um, we can actually facilitate, at the end of the day, access to, to knowledge of in, and information for so many readers um, around around the globe. So, my, but my uh, contribution to this panel will be more on the EU perspective, and I can tell you that it seems that um, controlled digital lending is not happening in Europe uh, yet, and um, the reasons for that they are also rooted in our in our legal on our legal system. Um, so in the EU, unlike in like in the US, we don't have a fair use based system. We have what is called an exemptions based system. So basically copyright law provides for um, the exclusive rights or the economic rights of the right holders and then exemptions to those rights. Uh, but we do have like um, in more jurisdiction across the globe, um, the first first size doctrine, but the first size doctrine does not apply to uh, digital copies, um, with the exemption of um, computer programs. But that's um, a separate discussion. Um, but when it comes to to, to books um, and ebooks, uh, they are not subject to the first size doctrine. So that means that right holders can control what happens in secondary markets. Um, but when it comes to lending, we have a special regime uh, which is regulated in the um, Rent and Lending uh, Directive. Um, and this regime actually provides for conditions in which um, lending of books uh, take place um, by libraries. Um, however, this is a directive of 2006, so quite um, some time before uh, the distribution of, uh, of, of books uh, online. 
uh, and especially by um, by libraries. So actually, we have a we have actually a quite interesting case uh, at uh, EU level. So we have the European Court of Justice that have interpretative power uh, to clarify. Um, the compatibility, for example, of national um, legislation with EU law. And this case was a, a Dutch case in which um, it was um, a question um, the, to what extent the regime that applies to um, the lending by libraries of physical books can be extended um, to e-books. And the court made an um, extremely interesting uh, and important um, the reasoning, which basically says that um, the the lending uh, or the definition of lending and and, uh, and renting in the context of the directive is technology neutral, so it does not really matter you know which technology you use to lend books as long as the conditions are fulfilled, um, and therefore lending also covers um, digital copies, um, provided that of course they come from a lawful a source. Um, and, and in that ruling, the, the court made um, an interesting reflection, which actually acknowledged the need for copyright to adapt to the technology and, 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 the, and, the, and the economic realities in which, um, in which uh, uh, we live, and seeing the important role of, of libraries in, 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 in a, as enables of um, access, uh, access, access to knowledge, clearly um, online um, and, and digital lending plays an extremely important an important role to fulfill um, this um, mandate that the libraries have. And if we look then at the context of controlled digital lending, what if controlled digital lending will take place in Europe if libraries, for example, will scan um, uh, copies of books in order to um, uh, lend them uh, virtually? Um, the conditions that actually needs to be fulfilled according to the law, it actually needs to be um, made available for, for use during a limited period of time without direct or indirect economic advantage um, for exploitations and authors have to be remunerated. How are authors actually remunerated through the lawful acquisition of the book? Either because the book is bought directly by the, by the libraries or because they have, been, they have been donated, but that physical book um, uh, the sale of that physical book have been actually the remuneration of the um, of the relevant right um, uh, right holders. Um, of course, and, and in Europe and national levels, so each country can adopt additional um, conditions uh, as long as they are compatible with the spirit of the um, of the legislation. Uh, for example, that books should have been put in circulation. Um, uh, first before um, the lending takes place. Um, however, we have also seen, um, and this has been uh, actually reported, and I hope that my, my colleagues that are um, in the librarians community can actually explain that better. Um, sometimes the legislation is um, not so clear. And there is a, with legislation not being clear, that means that there is a risk for the libraries of being sued. And libraries, they actually cannot afford being being sued and going through, you know, uh, ex uh, very extensive um, proceedings and and, and 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 risk having to being condemned of, for paying damages. Uh, so clearly, having an unclear legislation does not help um, to to facilitate this type of of lending. And um, the feedback also that we, that we that we get is that. Um, in Europe, this type of lending does not happen, not even um, the lending of, of e-books in the exercise of the exemption, because most of this um, type of lending is covered by uh, licenses. And um, that means that actually, if it's covered by licenses, those institutions or libraries that can afford licensing are those that are able to offer it. Um, uh, because of, of, of fears of, 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 of being sued, so basically only the rich institution at the end of the day are the ones that can afford this type of lending, um, which adds an, an additional problem, um, the risk of having to face you know, unfair terms and, uh, terms and conditions, terms of use, because here we are entirely in the field of uh, contractual freedom. And as we have learned in, in copyright law, 
uh, right holders enjoy a quite range, a quite broad uh, contractual and technological freedom to decide how the works are exploited, which also have uh, led to conflicts with um, uh, not only exceptions and limitations, but also with, 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 fundamental, with fundamental rights. Um, I did actually, after our discussion of last week, a little bit of research, and, and unsurprisingly, um, Ray holders and publishers are um, extremely against uh, controlled digital lending, even if it's not happening in, um, in Europe. Um, but still, um, the role you know, of a library is far too important to leave it to commercial and contractual agreements. And as it was mentioned uh, before by Corinne, um, we can we cannot just simply replace you know the role of a library, and uh, and certainly in times like uh, uh, like the, the the times that we are living today, um, that force us to adapt and uh, control digital lending is a way to adapt, um, but that does kind of come at the at the at the expense of um, libraries you know bearing a huge risk of um, uh, of uh, of being of being sued for just simply trying to fulfill their public mandate. Um, so I will stop uh, here and I look very much to the, to the discussion. Thank you, Manon. Well, thank you very much, Agustina. I really like uh, the, the, uh, what you said about the publishers that are very much against CDL, even though it's not happening in Europe. And that goes with what I'm feeling is going on in times of pandemic. It's the circle, the wagon thing where uh, all the uh, IPRs are, uh, owners are on the defensive and on the attack, uh, yeah, on the defensive in the US and on the attack everywhere else, when in fact they should be uh, participating in, in saving our culture and, uh, and helping with their recovery. But um, we, have, uh, we have now uh, Stephen Weider, who is the manager of policy and advocacy at the International Federation of Library Association and uh, an institution, and they represent all top types of libraries globally. Uh, it leads on work to help libraries strengthen their advocacy for the support and laws they need to support equitable universal access to information. Um, he works also on uh, uh, internet governance, human rights, sustainable development and cultural heritage. And I know Stephen very well because we sit next to each other at many, uh, uh, WIPO meetings, and uh, I'm uh, leaving the floor for him. You can talk for the library institution globally, for sure. Thank you, Manon, for, for the invitation. And uh, it's almost getting to the stage where I'm missing those chairs at WIPO that you can't get out of. So I'm almost looking forward to getting back to those. So um, briefly, just to explain, so IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, and we are um, the global organization for libraries of all types. So the school library is supporting schools, public libraries supporting communities, people throughout their lives, the big national libraries, which are copyright libraries, academic research libraries throughout. And obviously our members work in very different jurisdictions under very different sets of laws. So a challenge like, uh, a, a, no, not a challenge, um, an initiative like Control Digital Lending is always fascinating because it, it both highlights what's possible and it highlights all the frustrations that come from different approaches from one country to the next. Um, to give a very brief idea, I think I know, people will be aware of the challenges that libraries have faced during the pandemic, in particular the frustration that so many of the works that have been legally acquired um, in physical copies are just stuck behind the doors where according to public health rules, you're not allowed to give access to them. At best, you can provide curbside pickup or delivery services. And this is obviously firstly causing this frustration, but also forcing libraries to turn to what is in the end a highly unregulated digital content market. It, it is a wild west, Agustin underlined that freedom of contract reigns supreme. And they're, forced, they're being forced to see this huge difference between a relatively regulated physical market and an unregulated digital one. Clearly also libraries are facing the longer term issue of the growing disconnect between 
the ease of working digitally, the expectations of users, and of course, as has been mentioned, the potential to do things securely to control the number of copies out there and what the law permits. So in terms of how, how libraries have experienced controlled digital lending, um, as users, it's been it's widely it's been relatively widely encouraged um, and not just in the US and Canada. So I was happy looking around and we can see libraries in Uruguay, in France, in Spain, in Haiti, in the UK and others recommending to their students that they should take a look at what they can access through controlled digital lending. This has been a huge issue for many historical works, artworks, a lot of social science works, which might otherwise not be, not be available at all or only available through interlibrary loan slowly. Um, and of course, I know, as everyone has said so far, it's been a fantastically powerful resource during the pandemic. It has also been true that so far the main examples, it's mainly been libraries in the US, but also Canada that have actually made their collections available. Um, as Agustine mentioned just now, and Julia Reda underlined at last week's Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue meeting, often this is because libraries are not really risk takers. They don't have the legal team at their disposal. They need the precedent, the guarantee that what they're doing is safe. This obviously isn't helped by the fact that the right holder lobby tends to be very ready to reach out for their copy of Nostradamus whenever something appears on the horizon and predict the end of the world, because a great way of scaring libraries off is when there's a massive uh, political shout out, a massive sort of scream of pain. This is a pretty effective way of encouraging libraries not to go there because it looks dangerous. So even that sort of comms effort, which in the end it is, can have an effect on behavior by discouraging activity, by discouraging, engage, discouraging engagement. Nonetheless, we have examples that are there outside the US and Canada is a good one because it shows that you don't necessarily, or we can't really believe it shows that you don't necessarily need fair use in order to make controlled digital lending work. At least in Canada, the suggestion at the moment is what you need is just a good research and private use exception exhaustion, a sale, and some measure of technological neutrality. These aren't criteria, these aren't characteristics that are reserved to Canada. What is noteworthy that is in the case of Canada, the focus appears to be mainly on out of commerce works. So there's a really interesting legal opinion for ha uh, Hamilton Public Library in Ontario, which suggests that Canada's fair dealing factors, and in particular consideration of the nature of the use and its effect on markets, speak in favor of giving access to out of commerce works through control digital lending being perfectly possible. We see the same from the University of Alberta, which has made uh, collections which are primarily out of commerce, some in the public domain available in this way. There's also a really good example, which I encourage everyone to look at on the Internet Archive's own blog about Aruba, which highlights the potential of control digital lending to act as a platform for, for, for providing access especially for smaller language communities. It's worth mentioning, of course, that Aruba is um, technically part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and so it is sitting under this sort of exemptions type law, but they've, they've looked to make it work. In this case, the library was able to make use in particular of the National Emergency Library in order to support learning in Papiamento, the local language, while schools were physically closed. Doubtless, the fact it's a small community made it possible to identify authors and make works available more quickly. But it's also interesting in terms of giving libraries a, a model, a, a platform, of sparing them at the expense of setting up their own platforms or having to go through a big commercial intermediary, which often brings extra costs and brings a sort of black box element to the whole thing. Um, it's worth underlining, and I think this has come out a little bit already, that the, these provisions aren't particularly crazy. Um, Agustin talked about having e-lending provisions in Europe, which, uh, which underlined that digital copies of works can be lent out thanks to the, the CGAU uh, judgment that's been already presented. I think an interesting challenge for the coming months, years, would be to test clearly the question of whether a digitized version of a physical book can be lent under these provisions, not just books that have originally been acquired as e-books. This is potentially powerful because, of course, commercially available ebooks tend to come covered in contract terms and technological protection measures that make it impossible for libraries to use them for lending. Clearly, I don't know, there are also examples from the Orphan Works Directive, the Out of Commerce Works provisions in the Copyright and the Digital Single Market Directive, 
which would even achieve something similar to the National Emergency Library. Of course, in these situations, there are major questions about how to ensure that the conditions that need to be met in order to deliver on these possibilities, as well as the infrastructures in place, are appropriate. Um, going back to areas where it will be interesting to look at what's possible or not under current laws, there may be scope in the UK, Australia and others where there are fair dealing exceptions, relative flexibility on shifting between digital and physical and exhaustion principles to act. And we're just seeing recently in Australia some quite high level proposals in order to increase possibilities for libraries in order to provide digital access to their collections. And that's really going to be one to watch. Of course, when that happens, there are questions that come up around public lending right. Um, either because lending is covered by copyright, which is the case in the UK and is the case for e-lending now as well, um, or because there's separate legislation on this is in Australia, or because you just have a public lending right body in Canada, which may require that if you're going to lend, you need to pay. Um, other areas of law which may be interesting and which can be seen as parallel with this are the traditions of document supply and interlibrary lending, which have long taken place within countries, across areas, across borders. It's another interesting angle to look at. Now, looking forward, I think these sorts of tools, controlled digital lending has a really interesting potential to help libraries show their value in a digital age. It, it does cost money for libraries to preserve a book. Even when you take digital copies, you need to upgrade the formats from time to time because they disappear, they die off. So libraries do spend money. There is a cost in preserving works. When you can give access to them, this increases the value. And we know that cuts are threatened to have already happened. There will be more pressure on spending. If we don't allow libraries to deliver on their missions to show the value of their investment in these books, there's a risk of this value being brought into question. And arguably, if we lose that, we lose the potential for libraries to contribute to the cultural recovery that Manon mentioned at the beginning. There's also the interesting question for libraries that can control digital lending provide a fallback, a sort of idiot guard, ensuring that libraries wanting to make their collections available have an alternative if they can't get good terms for licensing. This could help ensure that the discussions we hold are not so much about value capture, about extracting revenues for every single use by libraries, but rather about being able to engage in a discussion with rights holders about how you can come up with models that really provide better value for libraries, because in the end, especially with more modern books coming out, what libraries need to be able to do, they don't want to buy 50 copies of a book. They want to have a license where you can buy one copy and lend it out 50 times at the same time. Control digital lending doesn't provide an answer for that, but we can actually move on to that discussion of how we get better licensing models if we don't have, to, if there isn't always the risk that the publisher can just say, no, you can't do that, nothing is possible. So, I think CDL has a really interesting potential here in enabling us to move the discussion on for libraries when they're getting involved in licensing discussions. That's me done. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's it's very interesting. CDL is really showing what is possible, <laughs> and I understand your frustration. We we are uh, we have a very short time, so I will introduce. Uh, Luis Villarreal Villalon, who is a director of Innovarte. He's been the Minister of the Industrial Property Court of Chile, uh, Intellectual Property Advisor to the Ministry of Education, Consultant for the Legal Department of the Latin American Development Bank, Advisor in International Reforms and Negotiation on IP to Ecuador, Uruguay, UNESCO, um, IFLA, World Blind Union, among others. Uh, I know him. Uh, at first as a delegate of Chile at WIPO, where he was one of the most impressive delegates who would take the floor. And he was one of the uh, power behind uh, the push for the Treaty for uh, the treaty of Marrakesh for the, the blind and people with disabilities. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have Luis on board here on CDL board. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Manon. Of, uh, for me, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to, to be with, with su such a group of uh, experts uh, and uh, well-intended activists. Uh, well, I, I, first, I, I would, like, would like to start saying that uh, it's surprising, you know, that we we, uh, we are discussing, you know, how could we do a controlled digital lending in, in a time of a pandemic where we all be, be uh, thinking on you know, how to punish those libraries who do not provide a controlled digital lending. 
because unless you you do control digital lending uh, digitally you are exposing you know the life of many and and, and the, the, the explosion of the pandemic uh, b because of uh, the access uh, to books that we know that we cannot uh, function as a society without them so 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 so, so my, my first thing is that the, the control digital lending not is it's not only an issue of access to knowledge but also it's an issue of access to life and and it it, it should be seen as, as a need uh, uh, and a mandate for all libraries in the world so so i i think that we we, we should start thinking that uh, this is an issue of national security, the world security, and uh, we, we hope that the government uh, understand this before it's too late, especially when, when we see that uh, there is a, a push for reopening schools and reopening you know, normal life, uh, but uh, each book might be a, a, you know, a, a weapon of, of mass destruction uh, so we, we, we need to, to really uh, play digital. Uh, uh, saying that, uh, I would like to, 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 to go to uh, three uh, uh, ideas. You know, first is the justification uh, uh, um, from the point of view of uh, normal copyright in, 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 in normal times and, uh, and, and the possibility of uh, countries to adopt uh, control digital lending and the, the international frame that allow it, allow it or uh, or restrict it. So uh, the the uh, with regard to the justification and is, is my dog uh, uh, barking too loud? Uh, well, can't help it. Uh, so uh, so the, the first thing is that from a Latin American point of view, uh, the the reason to have a, a digital lending, control digital lending in Europe, it, it, it expands much more in Latin America, where we, we have seen that even some ebooks that are available in Europe and the United States are not sold, are not licensed uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin American countries uh, like Chile. We, we, we have a case of, uh, uh, I was ju just researching to, to prepare this presentation and asking the libraries you know, if they have some uh, cases, and, and yes, they, they are, there are some cases that uh, very recently, like three or four days ago, with regard to a, a books of Julio Cortázar that you will see in, a, in, in the PowerPoint. Uh, so so we, we, we don't have even uh, enough ebooks. And also we, we have the issue that even collective societies have not updated the, their rules to, to request a license uh, for something like a, uh, control digital lending. If you go to a collective society and ask them, you know, how much do I pay? Well, they they, they don't provide for the service. So so, in addition to to the to, to the health need and and the the cultural need, we, we have a, a clearly a market failure that also is uh, creating a a problem uh, to access. So, but but the, but there is an an, an additional. A issue that also has been highlighted in the case of Chile, you know, consulting with the, our friends from the libraries, they have seen that there has been an increase in, in the cost of uh, ebooks around a 25 to 35 percent from the, the previous year. So, so it shows that there has be, been an, an, an abusive behavior, you know, on the ebook e e market. And also, we, we have numbers of, of how much have changed, uh, you know. Obviously, because of the pandemic, on on the use of uh, physical books, you know, the request, you know, in 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 some uh, libraries of, of a uh, university uh, in Concepcion, they, they, they told me that the, uh, in 2019 they have a 60% uh, use of print and 40% of ebooks uh, on the patrons, and now they they have moved to 95% uh, of access to ebooks and only, of course, 5% to uh, physical books. So, so, so we see that it's, it's an urgent need uh, of uh, more access uh, through digital means. Uh, so, so the question now is, what does national law provide to allow this type of uh, uses? And, and first, if, if, if we, we, we take a look on all regions, uh, you know, Europe, US, uh, you will see there is a, a 
from the national law perspective, a, a very big uh, variety of options. You know, we, we, we see in, in, in the case of uh, the Europe that you have a, a right of lending for the author, but an express exception uh, for uh, lending. So that gives some uh, room to, inter to make an interpretation of this exception, express expression providing uh, lending. Uh, and, and in the other hand, you have the US who uh, uh, do, do not uh, provide for a, a lending right, nor a lending exception, but they can play with a flexible solution that will be first used. Uh, in addition, in, in the in US, uh, as far as I understand it, they don't recognize expressly the right of making available provide in Article 10 WCT, and instead they, they play with reproduction and distribution right, which gives a lot of uh, role to exhaustion, uh, which is not the case if you are in a country where you provide express making available uh, right. So, so uh, there is a difference, and in, in, in if you look to Latin America, you, you will see that some countries uh, provide for uh, lending right and, and exceptions, and in other cases, there is no uh, lending right, and there is no exception, and and and, and in any case, none of them have a, a, a flexible solution. So we have to rely on express exceptions, and uh, and, and and that's a big problem because if you see express ex exceptions, you you won't find anything that might meet control digital lending as we have defined it, uh, and uh, even. Uh, in many cases, you don't have exceptions at all. Remember, you know, I, I will ask to uh, ask later, you know, Agustina, how they do in Argentina, where, where they they don't have a, a, a express exceptions for libraries, or in the case of Uruguay, they don't have none at all. So, so the, definitely everything is going under illegal if they do something. So, 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 so as a, a first conclusion, we, we see that. Uh, the solution that we might find in the US that works, it might not be uh, the solution for us in Latin America and, and vice versa uh, because of the different the, the law. So we need to look uh, above to, to look international law. What does international law uh, uh, tell us? But, but before to go into international law, a, a positive note that is even that we don't have express exceptions, you know, uh, in Latin America, some countries have other exception that might be helpful uh, and serve a partial, partially the, the purpose. For example, in Chile and Ecuador, we, we have an article that has that was built based on the EU directive possibility of digital uh, digi digitalization and making available in terminals within the library. We we, we expanded in a reform that I, I, I took. Uh, I was advising that we advise it. To, to have an exception that allows the library to, to provide you know, digitalization for all their books, but making available not to terminals within the library, but terminals relate, in, related to the institution. So you, 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 you might interpret it this that you can uh, access at home, you know, as long as it's within the, the server of the university. Although, of course, it, it, you, you cannot uh, download, you cannot make a copy, uh, and you, uh, and, and you cannot uh, uh, take it to, to a server different than the server that is coming from the university. So, so th there are some uh, uh, space and there is some practice that can uh, also be modeled within the uh, uh, Latin American examples. But let, let's go to international law, which is, uh, I think is, 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 is a key issue considering that we need an international solution. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the frame for international solution will depend on uh, which country you are, uh, considering that there are different treaties that affect what you can do. But but uh, but starting with with the, with the trips, uh, in trips, we, we, I don't see there is a a, a problem uh, at all uh, with uh, control digital lending, especially because trips don't in Article Six the expressly rules out the issue of uh, liability with regard to exhaustion. So any country might provide whatever they think uh, on exhaustions of right, Article uh, 6. And uh, uh, also uh, trips do not provide for lending right, don't, don't provide for distribution right, and even not for making available right. And the, 
reproduction right in TRIPS is un understood not to be digital reproduction uh, because of the fixation requirement in TRIPS. Okay, um, four seconds. Uh, uh, the left, uh, I, I, I've been told. So, so, so in TRIPS, we, we have a, 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 a very good ground uh, to provide uh, a solution, uh, not, not only because of uh, there is not mandate on some core rights, but also because uh, TRIPS allows you to, to have a limitation to the right based in national security, uh, which is Article 73, and, and, and also you, you, you might limit the uh, in injunctions or, or the enforcement uh, based in Article 44, uh, two, which is a sort of a compulsory licensing that applies to a, any type of right. So, so I, I think, and, and I'm, I'm finishing with this, uh, is that we, TRIPS is, is, is a solution. Uh, we, we, we have seen that there is a great uh, proposal from India and South Africa, supported by some of the NGOs uh, here, uh, asking uh, uh, so, some type of waiver for uh, TRIPS obligation. And, and I think the, the international community should support it uh, as well. And I stop here before uh, Manon uh, digitally uh, uh, explodes me. Thank you. Oh, come on. I was just reminding you because you could you could go on and I, I would love to listen to all okay, these details. Okay. Okay. But I have something more to tell about uh, uh, the the WIPO copyright treaty, but uh, happy if you ask me. Again. Maybe in the discussion, if we have some time, yeah. if people have questions, uh, I, I just want to thank you. Oh, it's, yes. it's very informative as usual. And I, I feel like I should take your class if you give a class one day. <laughs> But uh, we have now Jane, Jamie Love, James Love, who is the director of Knowledge Ecology International and whose training is in economics and finance. But he, uh, he works uh, mostly on the production management and access to knowledge resources, as well as uh, aspect of competition policy. Um, he works, uh, many of you know him for his work on access to medicine, but he's also a big access to knowledge uh, expert. And also with uh, Lewis, he was very much involved in the push for the treaty for people with uh, disability. And um, I'm going to give the floor to Jamie now, if I see him. I'm Jamie? Here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Can you see me? Um, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to try and share my screen. I, I, I'm going to talk about um, other areas of, um, of the law where, because of the pandemic, uh, there, there have been concessions made for the pandemic. See if I can do this properly in terms of. Um, oh, uh, I have too many screens open here. Um, let's see here. Let me try it again here. Um, Yeah, I think this is right. Um, okay, can you see this? Okay, is this is this is this being shared right now? My slides. Uh, I I assume that this is being shared, so I'm going to just go through this. Um, it is. It is. We uh, we can see it. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the way commercial rights are have been influenced because of the pandemic. I'm going to start with a discussion of the United States. The first thing I want to mention is the, the United States Defense Production Act. And under this, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has issued a series of executive orders and memorandums. This is a really powerful authority. It gives the United States government the right to uh, take, take control of factories, uh, to dictate manufacturing, to set prices, all sorts of things. These are uh, the, the uh, items on this list are really just a few of the executive orders and memorandums implementing the executive orders or the authority that have been issued beginning in March 18th of this year. There's also been a series of actions designed to prevent people from being evicted from apartments. So if you think about intellectual property this is a contrast, this is real, real estate, which I think everyone would agree is property. And in these cases, 
in, in a number of situations, there have been measures that have been taken by the CDC and by other uh, act, actions by the federal government and, and by state governments to prevent landlords from evicting tenants if they can't pay their rent. Let's see, going the wrong way here. Uh, this is a, a provision in the CARES Act, which has, um, uh, it was uh, initially going to take place from March 27th to July 24th, but it's been expanded to the end of the year. And it, it covers, um, uh, it requires uh, all kinds of concessions for tenants, and it covers people that receive federally um, federally subsidized and guaranteed loans. It's actually a large proportion of the uh, financing mechanisms in the United States. If you own the house, uh, the, the Congress has also required that people that lend money on mortgages, mortgage holders, banks, other lending agencies are not, uh, are, 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 they're required by law to allow you to, to have forbearance, which is to say, to suspend the payment of your mortgage entirely during the uh, period of the pandemic or the period that's authorized on the pandemic. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't ever have to pay the money, but it means that you don't have to pay it now. And that's a concession to the fact that a lot of people lost their jobs during the pandemic. Student loan payments in the United States that are federally funded under the CARES Act have been uh, suspended to the end of this year. And that includes the principal and the interest on the loans. And that's, that's interest that you do not have to pay back. And this applies to federally, uh, uh, to, to federally held student loans, which is a large proportion of student loans in the United States. The United States Patent and Trademark Office has issued a whole series, uh, by my count, of roughly 20 notices relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. Among other things, uh, they've declared that the, the coronavirus is an extraordinary situation for affected applicants, patentees, uh, both for patents and trademarks. They've uh, waived signatures, uh, reduced fees or waived fees, extended deadlines, expedited examinations of uh, certain trademarks and patents. So the Patent and Trademark Office really sees the pandemic as, a, as a requiring uh, extraordinary measures. The United States Copyright Office has also undertaken a series of measures related to COVID. And that the, the head of the Copyright Office has, has uh, modified uh, a number of provisions, primarily that affect copyright owners themselves on issues such as registration. The Office of Budget Management in the United States, or Management and Budget, I should say, issued a memorandum on the 19th of March that had uh, a whole series of provisions that dealt with people that had contracts or provide services or grants from the United States government having to do with uh, everything you can possibly imagine in terms of the economic issues, the deadlines, and built much more flexibility into the system. Switching to the private sector, you see a number of publications, uh, including journals like the New England Journal of Medicine or news organizations like the Washington Post and the, the New York Times, others have uh, lifted the paywall restrictions on content that's related to the COVID-19 pandemic. You, you have seen, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a federal executive order that uh, um, has to do with the designation of specific goods is scarce in the context of COVID-19. Some of it involves uh, uh, set issues as uh, N95 mask ventilators, certain drugs, uh, sterilization devices, medical gowns and apparel, personal protective equipment. And these, these allowed a number of different steps to be taken by the federal government to secure access to the supplies and to reallocate them. There's been uh, initiatives on price gouging. Uh, there's, there's, there's forms of regulation of prices now that did not exist previously. And it, it's only related to the pandemic. So this is a special thing. More than 30 states have some sort of price gouging forms on their books, most of which are typically triggered by the declaration of a statewide or a national public emergency. 
There's a, an executive order uh, by the president on price gouging, and Attorney General William Barr is, is, is initiating actions in this area. Internationally, the TRIPS agreement, as, when it relates to patents, does provide that you can waive certain conditions in the compulsory license of patents relating to the prior authorization attempts to achieve voluntary licenses before issuing a compulsory license and uh, issues about the compensation, which are waived in the case of a national emergency or other circumstances of extreme urgency. So these, these are certainly relevant to cases of a pandemic, but this applies for patents in the TRIPS. It does not apply to copyright. However, uh, Article 73 of the TRIPS agreement is broader than the provision on patents. It applies to everything in the TRIPS agreement. And it says that nothing in the agreement can be construed to prevent a member from taking any action which it considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interest. And the South Center, in a series of papers, has highlighted this exception and encouraged countries to invoke this exception during the period of the pandemic, saying that the Article 73, subparagraph P, uh, B exception applies for the COVID pandemic. Recently, on October 2nd, there was a communication from India and South Africa, and they've made a proposal for a waiver of certain provisions of the agreement for the prevention and containment and treatment of COVID. Their particular waiver goes to several issues. It goes to, uh, it goes to patents. It also goes to uh, copyright and go, goes to data. In the area of copyright, they have a carve out for performance rights, but they apply to other parts of copyright. And uh, it also goes to rights and data that relate to the, to the pandemic and know-how. In Germany, uh, on March 27, 2020, they adopted a special law on compulsory licensing that uh, allows the, uh, the, the Minister of Health to issue uh, what they call use orders for patents during the pandemic and during the emergency. So in Germany, any patent that stands in the way of getting any kind of treatment available in Germany during the pandemic can be waived uh, immediately by the Minister of Health. Canada also uh, passed a, a new provisions related to, in March, they also passed new, new provisions about the same time Germany did that deal with patent rights during the pandemic. So I'm gonna stop that right here. I'm gonna stop the sharing. I think that from our point of view, uh, it's obvious that during the pandemic, lots of things are different. Uh, schools are shut down in a lot of places. Libraries have restricted access or no access. And during that period, it seems normal to us that the function of libraries that there should be mechanisms to allow libraries to function as well as possible, particularly with so many people that do not have access to schools as well and are required to do things like uh, home homeschooling or, or um, don't have access to, to um, uh, the kind of materials you normally have in a, in a school setting or a, a, a library uh, with access to a library. I just wanted to uh, go over those things because I think it provides some context in the particular case with the Internet Archives where the issue is whether or not what they did and changing the rules of controlled uh, digital lending during the pandemic were appropriate. Because I know that the, uh, the Authors Guild has spoken out against it and four large publishers have sued them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. So um, uh, I think we have about two minutes. Uh, I wouldn't mind if, uh, if uh, people were a uh, asking question to Augustin first, because I think he has to leave early, right? Oh, actually, so, actually, it's fine. I can. I can it's fine. Longer. So I, really I, will, I will ask uh, uh, the speakers to ask a question, and I will start the roundabout by uh, uh, the one that raised his hand, whether he wanted or not. Stephen, do you have a question to ask your co-speakers? I'm, 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 I have a list of things I'm going to be looking into in more detail. Okay. How about you, Corinne? Um, <laughs> I don't have a great um, question off the top of my head. I guess I'm curious to hear more actually about the, um, the Latin American experience. Because um, I think that's quite interesting. And I'm wondering if you have numbers in terms of 
Um, how many people are taking advantage of, of the options that are available? And that would be for uh, Lewis to answer, I think. Oh, oh, okay. I... <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I will be brief. Uh, well, we, we in, in in this moment we we, we don't have a, a I don't have a statistics on Latin America. Um, my, my guess is in Latin America almost none is using, except in the case of Chile. I in in the case of Chile. Uh, we ask it to uh, the, uh, universities who are doing this because uh, to do the digitalization is costly. It's not not any library can do it. And uh, and from around thirteen libraries from uh, a, 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 a group of uh, a, 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 a universities that are in in a, in a related to the government, only two of them were using you know widely. The the, the, the the possibility of digitizing and putting online to all of the, their students. So so it still is is a is a limited. But uh, those who are using it, they are really exploding. You know the the, the, the exception. Uh, so we, we still have to see the reaction from the right holders. That was actually yeah. going to be my follow up uh, question. Uh, was the kind of the reaction that? And actually, this for, for anyone on the panel. I'm curious in your respective um, jurisdictions what you've seen in terms of um, challenges from uh, from the publish from publishers or other rights holder groups. Well, um, I, I I I I think that we're um, sometimes we we worry about what we can share on listservs, which is not really controlled digital lending, and it's more of a fair use issue. Uh, and we're wondering if it should be different during the pandemic for certain types of things which are really uh, related to uh, people understanding where, where things stand in terms of policies about the development of drugs or access to drugs and things like that. It's a lot of the best information is really behind paywalls. And uh, so we, uh, but the, the public interest in knowing these things is really intense right now. And so we, we, we would think that the four-step test should, should move a little bit in the United States. And I would add to this that very, very often I hear people focusing on uh, CDL, which is part of an institution, whether it's uh, through the, the university networks that the Hattie Trust has together or the states where I live or the school district where my grandchildren go to. But there's also a lot of people like me who are not affiliated to a specific uh, <laughs> library per se. And I'd like to have access to a lot of uh, information or, or data or uh, software or things that I'm used to, uh, to get in a library. And I know it exists uh, on, a, on a digital format and I found find it very, very frustrating that I can't get it unless I go back to my old university work and I'm linked to that, I can't get access. So uh, Jamie was mentioning the public interest and I think that's, that's very important. There's a very broad public interest and it's not just institutions, schools and, and so on. It's also the public in general which needs to be retrained, which need to learn things because the world is getting to be different and where do we learn how to be different ourselves, if not through reading and, and looking at, uh, at uh, digital uh, information and knowledge uh, goods? I think I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to elaborate a little bit about the, uh, the copyright and the patent office in the United States. They've taken very aggressive steps to protect right owners. They have really not lifted a finger about thinking about the impact of intellectual property policies on the public during the pandemic. Stephen, you wanted to say something? Yes, yeah, so, 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 I, I, just on, on Jamie's last point there, I think I, I mentioned in the call, we've got Australia is almost explicitly looking at, at updating its laws. Um, we've seen the example from Hungary that Theresa Nobre detailed on a little bit earlier this afternoon, this morning, but obviously something coming from Victor Orban isn't always welcome. Um, in terms of how publishers have responded, um, 
you know, it, it's important, as I've said, and if often the publisher lobby organizations will have to take the most extreme position because they're, they're lobby organizations, that what, that's what happens. Um, we have seen plenty who have been sort of quite positive, quite open and are giving access to things. Some of the time it's because they see it's a sales opportunity and then they'll admit as such and this has been documented in the press. I think the real, one of the challenges though, and you get this from just looking at all of the commitments made to the ICOLC, the International Coalition of Library Consortia, is that for all of the generosity, the problem is it always comes in different forms with different sell by dates, with different possibilities, with different terms and conditions attached. And so while it's great that there's generosity, if it just forces libraries each time to go back and read the contract, um, it's not any easier to deal with. And arguably, and I think the points we made consistently here, we're not talking about things that should be reliant on goodwill or reliant on someone being in a good mood or being sort of sufficiently enlightened to provide access. There needs to just be this sort of this guarantee that these sort of basic uses, public interest uses, should not be something that's a risk factor in this. There's plenty of risk factors out there. If we want to manage risks in the future, that when another pandemic comes, we can, <laughs> there's a way of reducing this risk. Uh, do you all think that uh, there, there should be an international solution uh, to, uh, to this, or should we keep doing the <laughs> the national and the uh, exception by exception with playing with different things. I mean, what, what, what's your thinking about international solution? Oh. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Augustine. Yeah, if I, if I can yeah, mm -hmm. chip in on, uh, on that. Uh, realistically, I think it's difficult to talk about international solutions, uh, especially when we have um, quite differentiated systems um, and actually picking up on, on what Stephen have just said, the, the idea of having an exemptions based system is to reduce that risk. Because one of the reasons why, for example, we don't have fair, fair use in, in, in Europe is to avoid the risk of, of litigation because ultimately you have to, you end up before a court and you, and, and you need to prove that you fall under the, this, this general clause. Um, ideally, we should have a combination of both systems, but the, the principle of having exemptions and limitations is exactly to prevent that risk. And I found incredible that, like Stephen was saying, that if you need to go back every time to your contract terms, you know, for each single publisher, which in the case of a library can, can imply a, a quite extensive list of, <laughs> of contract terms, uh, why on earth do we have exemptions? which have been designed to give legal certainty, both to right holders and also to the beneficiaries of the exemptions. So um, I think that here we, we really have a case for more, um, more, more, more clarity rather than reinvent the system because exemptions are there. The simple fact is because they are so unclear that they are not used in practice. Then maybe uh, the, uh, the, the contracts, the, the, the contractual terms are sometime undermining the exception and I think that that is, <laughs> you can clarify the exception all you want if by contract and the negotiation is totally unfair in the sense that libraries have a, a public interest mandate, so they have to provide the information. So you can see that the negotiation are intrinsically unfair. Um, that's why, in a way, the, the, the system of exception and the system of contracts for libraries is, is just exploding right now, I think. And uh, we're all in bad shape. I think that um, I, I was in a, in a meeting last week at the American University College of Law, which was extremely interesting and where they explore the idea that most system have some kind of fair use all systems are a little bit hybrid because otherwise they wouldn't work. And I thought that was a very interesting point. And uh, I think that I understand the exception being French myself. <laughs> I didn't know about fair use until I moved to this country and I love it. <laughs> but um, I understand that uh, it's, it's not a concept that as a block can be just pushed into every jurisdiction. But having said that, I do think that we should have an unfair contract uh, uh, solution, 
how to deal with the infra contracts. And I, I know that the uh, publisher had a, a little uh, bonus in the, in the UK 20 years ago when they got exempt from unfair contracts. I think so I, maybe we should reverse that now. The, the, the governments in a lot of areas, they just make some contract provisions just illegal. Like I, 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 in landlord tenant law, you, you can't put whatever you want in a, in a contract with a, with a, with a tenant. And uh, uh, I, so I think the, the idea that there are limits to what you can do contract, there's a provision in the, in the TRIPS agreement on unfair contracts as well, Article 40, which it really green lights the idea that you can deal with unfair contracts. So between the first sale doctrine, the provision on unfair contracts, I think you have a lot of flexibility in, in terms of the international framework. The other thing that Luis brought up at the previous seminar was that if you, if you fashion exceptions as limitations and remedies, they're not subject to the three-step test. And that was, in fact, what uh, the Librarian of Congress proposed in the U.S. for our, our orphan works legislation uh, some years ago. And, and I think that uh, that that should be discussed. So this issue of unfair contracts, relationship contracts uh, uh, and exceptions and the limitations and remedies should be the focus of the reform agenda. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we are being told by the master of all technologies that we, <laughs> we reach our end point. Uh, I think that we should have another, uh, another Zoom webinar on unfair contracts soon. I thank you all for uh, being here and uh, uh, enlightening us about what's going on. And I hope to see you soon in real life too, because there's a little bit of Zoom fatigue, of course. Goodbye. Thank you.